Welcome. Welcome to our first United Methodist Church Marble Falls worship service. We're coming to you uh, at this time on our Facebook page, F-U-M-C-M-F. Uh, That's on Facebook. And our web page is F-U-M-C-MarbleFalls.com. And we just encourage you uh, uh, to, to keep in tune, watch our web page, and, and watch our broadcast. We're so delighted to be worshiping with you at this time. I do have a, uh, a couple of announcements I just want to share with you very shortly. During this time of uh, social distancing and shelter in place, uh, we want you to know that although our offices are closed, we're available and we want to be available for you. Our telephone numbers for each of the three pastors, myself, Pastor Tommy, Pastor Clay, and Pastor Ellen, were uh, sent out by email in our weekly email last Thursday. And we just really, if you need something, please call us. Uh, we're available by appointment, and we're available as needed. We just uh, uh, want you to know that in this time of uh, we're just really troubled, and things are happening that we are not far away. We're not far from you. So, please join us all this morning as we prepare to worship our God and our King.
What a wonderful way to begin our time together. Thank you so much. Friends, let us go to God in prayer. Loving and mighty God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this new opportunity to worship by video. Even though we miss our friends and our neighbors in worship this morning, we have the opportunity, oh God, to share with others, so many others. Thank you, oh God, for teaching us new things, for pushing us to do new things. Lord God, we pray this morning for those who are ill, dealing with this coronavirus or something else. Maybe it's the flu. Maybe it's just a bad cold or a stomach virus. Lord, be with all who are ill this morning. Be with all who are afraid. Those who are living in fear and afraid to leave their homes or perhaps can't leave their homes because of their health. Lord, help us to be wise in our decision making, to protect ourselves. Help us to reach out to our neighbors if we are healthy, that we might go to the grocery store or we might run errands for those who are unable to get out. Nudge us, O oh God, to check on our friends, our neighbors who have no contact right now. Maybe they have no family. Comfort them, O oh God, with your peace and with our presence, perhaps even with a phone call. Lord, be with researchers those who are trying to find a way to mitigate the symptoms and to heal those who are ill. Be with doctors, O oh God, as they work with the researchers. Seeking wisdom, O oh God, in all things. Be with our world leaders who are all coping with this. May they have wisdom. And Lord, may they set aside partisan politics to help all. Thank you, oh God. We pray for our first responders who are the medical hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We ask, oh God, that you are with all care facilities, with their staff members, with all the residents who feel particularly cloistered, particularly as one of our dear ones said to us this week, she feels incarcerated because she's in a care facility and cannot leave. And Lord, some of them, they don't leave anyway, but it's just the idea that they can't leave. They can't be with their friends and neighbors. Some are confined to their rooms. Be with all medical personnel all who seek to help during this difficult time. And now we pause and lift up others who are on our hearts today. We pray for Jackie as she was admitted to MD Anderson for developing symptoms similar. We pray for Rex Neal as he waits in reviewing his CT and MRI scans. We pray for Brian and Donna as they continue to work in medical assistance and their co-workers have pest tested positive for COVID. And we pray for Tim and Jackie Roberts. Lord God, in the midst of all that is going on, in the midst of the things that cause panic and fear, may we find comfort in you. May we remember the one who calmed the storm, your son, our savior, who taught us to pray, saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey friends, Stephanie here. I sure do miss you guys and wish you could be with us today, but I know that we're just having to do the social distancing and I'm sure you guys are learning Zoom and doing all these fun things in the process. Um, this is kind of a scary time, especially for kids. It can be very different. Um, we're having to live differently and we're living in uncertain times and scary times, but there was an old TV show called Mr. Rogers, and I want to share a quote from that show because I think it will kind of help us. And it says, when I was a boy and I would see scary things on the news, my mom would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find the people who are helping. Have y'all noticed the helpers? Because I know for sure that I have. They're, they're everywhere. They're making meals. Um, they're working in the grocery stores. They're delivering all this stuff for us. There are so many people doing so many good things and just stepping up in ways that they can. And it's kind of neat because you get a chance to be a helper too. You guys can think of creative ways to do that. Maybe you can make cards for people in nursing homes or grocery store attendants, police officers, firemen, truck drivers, and you can send it to them. You can get addresses. And you can maybe FaceTime or Zoom a friend so you're not so lonely and maybe help your family with dishes or laundry or ways of just being helpful because y'all are all confined together. But think of ways that you can do things um, in your own creative way. Think of ways that you can kind of be a helper and help those in need. This is a time for us really to band together and come together and unite. And we can still do that separated, which is kind of what we're doing here. And there's multiple ways to do that. So maybe think of some ways you can do that with your family this week. I want to leave y'all with this. It may not always seem like a beautiful day, but we can still make it one. So even though it's not going to always feel like the best days and we're stuck and we're confined, we can find ways to make it beautiful. And I know that you guys are just the ones to do that. And so I'm praying for you guys. Maybe this week we can Zoom some and spend some time virtually together. Miss y'all and um, praying for the best for everyone. And let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we still get to worship you. Thank you that we still get to be helpers and really grow your kingdom. It is always about you. We love you, and we thank you that you will show us where the need is, is needing to be met. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, church. Even though we're not passing a plate, I still want to give you guys, let you guys know that there's still an opportunity to give to support the ministries of this church. You can, of course, give by using the U.S. Postal Service and mailing us your giving that way. There is a drop-by mailbox that you can drop in as well. Uh, you can also text to give or go onto our website and click online giving. Thank you so much for continuing our support. Um, even though the doors are still closed, there are still souls to save and relationships with God to nurture. Let us help us continue to still do our work. Oh, my God. 
Thank you so much for that beautiful singing. Hear the word of God from 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 through 20. But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a say of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two says of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The captain of those hand of the king leaned and said to the man of God, If the Lord himself went to make windows in heaven, could this thing be? But he said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance of the gate. And they said to another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let's enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. So now come, let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. So they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold... There was no one there. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of the chariots and horses and the sound of a great army. So they said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel is hired against us, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. So they fled away in twilight and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was, and fled for their lives. And then these lepers came to the edge of the camp. They went into a tent, and they ate, and they drank. They carried off silver and gold and clothing, and went and hid them. They came back and entered another tent, and carried off things from it, and went and hid them. They said to another, we are not doing right. This is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, let us go and tell the king's household. So they came and called the gatekeepers of the city and told them, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there is no one to be seen or heard there, nothing but their horses tied and their donkeys tied and their tents as they were. Then the gatekeepers called out, and it was told within the king's household. And the king rose in the night and said to his servants, I tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they have gone out to the camp to hide themselves in open country, thinking when they come out to the city, we shall take them alive and get into the city. And one of the servants said, Let some men take five of the remaining horses, seeing those who are left there will fare like those of the multitude of Israel who have already perished. Let us send and see. So they took two horsemen, and they sent them after the army of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. So they went after them as far as the Jordan, and behold, all there was was littered with garments and equipments of the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king. The people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So, a say of fine flour was sold for a shekel, two sayas of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the captain of those who had leaned to have charges against the gate, and the people trampled him in the gate so that he died, as the man of God had said when the king came down to him. When the man of God had said to the king, Two sayers of barley shall be sold as a shekel, and a say a fine flour for a shekel, about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria. The captain answered the man of God, If the Lord himself would make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And he said, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, For the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Thank you, Clay. I was kind of gloomy there at the end, but the, the main point that I want to get across this morning is uh, just the courage of, of the lepers to go to move from their situation at the gate to go out and to experience the blessing of God and to come back and bring it into the city to save the whole city. I, I want to, to emphasize just the courage of, of these lepers to go and, and eventually they, they were the ones that God, God used them to, to save this whole city. Um, so let's pray. Father God, I, just, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you um, for your word and the story that, 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 that has blessed my life uh, over the past few years and it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, in, in Second Kings, and, and God, I just pray that this morning that, that my words will be your words, Father God, that, that your message will, will come across to, to each and every one of us, uh, and I just uh, pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, there's a story for, for many years in, in Monterey, California, a coastal town uh, was a pelican's paradise. As the fishermen cleaned their fish, they flung the guts to the pelicans, and the birds, they grew fat, and they grew lazy, and they grew content. Eventually, however, the, the guts, they were utilized, and there were no longer any snacks for the pelicans. But when the change came, the pelicans, they made no effort to fish for themselves. They waited around for someone to throw them food, just as they always had. But they, and so they, they grew scrawny, and they grew thin, and many, they, they, many of them starved to death. They were in a state of famine because they had forgotten how to fish for themselves. And this morning, I, I wonder, as I was preparing this, I, 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 God was really just sort of making me wonder how many of us are in the midst of a spiritual famine in our lives. I wonder how many of us are on the verge of starvation from God's word. I wonder how many of us have grown lazy as believers, hoping that someone is going to do everything for us do everything for the Lord. You know, someone, someone else will volunteer. Someone else needs to go to Emmaus more than I do. Someone else will donate emergency supplies. Someone else will volunteer to work alongside the Highland Lakes Crisis Network. Someone else will minister to Marble Falls. Someone else will reach the lost. And this problem in Monterey with the pelicans, it was solved by importing new pelicans from the south, birds accustomed to foraging for themselves, and they were placed among their starving cousins. And the newcomers, they immediately started catching fish, and before long, the hungry pelicans, they followed suit, and the famine was ended. So what happened? They didn't sit there anymore. They didn't sit there waiting to die. They moved. They took action. They went. So God, I, this morning, I want you to know that God will use anybody God can use anybody. God will use you. God can use you. But do we have the courage to go and to follow him? And so he's looking for, for those that will allow him to be himself. It's not what you bring to the table, but instead it's, it's what God is going to do in your heart. It's, it's instead what God is going to plant in you that is going to make a difference. Somebody may really need to hear this statement this morning. God majors in removing obstacles. Most people that really desire to do the will of God can come up with a list of things that, that need to happen before they can do what they really feel they ought to. And I, I'm guilty of this as well. And I, and I thought, man, if, if Jesus would just work in our heart and we would learn to, to leave the driving to him, what, what would happen? And so if you've got your Bible with you um, on the interwebs, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 7. And the title of this message uh, is a short title here, Courage to Go, but, but really I, I want us to think about the courage to move from our gate and go. And as we get further, it, it'll make a little bit more sense, but we never, we never know how close we are to the end of our lives. I don't want to get there and be full of the, the coulda, the woulda, the shoulda, thoughts in my life, the, the what ifs, but instead I, I, I want to know how God used me for his glory, for his name. 
Matthew chapter 15, verse eight says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I do not want to be like the Pharisees. And they spent their entire lives doing religious activities. But how sad it was that they spent all of their lives doing that. And then when, when God finally came to earth, they missed it. Are we, are we missing what God could be doing in our lives? So I want to talk a bit through the text and, and then outline some, some thoughts that the Lord has placed on my heart. And this morning, my, my main goal is to find hope in the midst of one of, in my opinion, one of the, one of the worst case scenarios in the word of God. And if God can do something in this situation, God can do something in your situation, God can do something in my situation, and even more applicable right now, God can, can do something in this situation that we're finding ourselves in. Um, God can and God will and is doing something in this virus situation that we are in. And so this is, this is really meant to be a word of hope. And so just to set a little bit of the context of what's going on before chapter 7, uh, before we dive into that, let's, let's back up a little bit and, and see what's going on there. Samaria was being held under, under a siege by Syria. And this meant that the Syrian army had surrounded the city of Samaria and cut off all the supplies so the city would be forced to, to surrender for lack of food, lack of water, and lack of toilet paper. Uh, no, I don't really think that that was going on there. But, uh, but anyway, calamity and death... They rule the context of this passage here. And we think it's bad today what's going on in our world, but, but really this was a much worse situation. I don't, I don't want to make light of it. The, the city of Samaria had, had reached a point where things could not possibly be worse. People were eating dove waste. People were eating, having to eat donkey heads. And, and worst of all, some women were even resorting to boiling their own children for food, for food. And so citizens were literally eating anything that they could find. And so seemingly all hope was gone, but man, do people need hope? Did you know that we can go 40 days without food? And, and we can go four days without water, four minutes without oxygen, but it's hard to live four seconds without hope. And so we need hope. And these people, they needed hope. And so let's take a look in verse one. It says, but Elijah said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, say a flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two say as a barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. And so a promise of hope was desperately needed. And Elisha's prophecy in verse 1 was not, it wasn't just a simple prediction of, you know, the exchange rates for food. Rather than breaking all of that down for us this morning, I'm just going to, I just want to get the point across that he was saying that something extraordinary was about to happen in the next 24 hours. Elisha was letting the people know that it was about to go down and God was about to do something great and there would be plenty to eat. God was about to intervene and fix this situation and that his sovereignty would be illustrated for the people of Israel. But understand this though, when God reveals something to your soul through the spirit of God, you can believe that there will always be a wrestling match with human opinion. You'll always want to throw your two cents in and, and sort of begin to create a scenario where you're saying, God, there is just no way that this could happen. And then we'll even begin to try to make it spiritual and say that the only way it could be different is, God, you would have to perform a miracle. Well, let me tell you this morning, God is in the miracle business. In verse 2, we see this. Let's, let's listen at this human opinion slash speculation laid directly beside the word of God and we see that God has sent a man of God who has proclaimed what God is going to do, but yet there's doubt. And so let's listen to how this responds. And in verse two it says, then the captain on whose the hand of the king leaned said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? Now that sounds like a question, but it's not. It's, it's sarcasm. He questions where this abundance of food would come from. It would take an exodus-like miracle. He's saying that even if God made windows in heaven and rained down blessings, it still may not be enough. In essence, he is mocking the prophet, which is essentially mocking the Lord himself. And so the captain's response to Elisha's prophecy is a reflection 
of his disbelief. He had no faith that God could or even would do this thing. But let me add this. God has made windows in heaven. Throughout scripture, there's, there's multiple places where references of, are made to the windows of heaven being opened for God's blessings to be poured out over his people. God has placed windows in heaven, and God can open windows in heaven and pour out more of a blessing that you or I are able to receive. In other words, God will do more with you than you could ever anticipate. And so the second half of verse 2, we, we see uh, Elisha responding. He says, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. So basically, Elisha is letting this guy know, you are going to regret your disbelief. You won't experience the blessings of God. And we'll see that at the end of this, as we've already seen uh, in verse 20. But here's a, here's a great one-liner. If you don't see it before you see it, you'll never see it. I was kind of confused, and I don't know who said it, but it's a great word. Um, faith, in, the, in, in other words, faith in the, in the word and promises of God, that is how we see it before we see it. Proverbs 29, 18, I love the way the, the King James Version puts this. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so our faith determines our experience in the blessings and the promises of God. So the officer, the captain, he had put his trust in logic. But we must put our trust in the power of God, not in logic. And so to the believer, we've, we've got to remember what God has done in the past. We've got to remember the mercy that he has shown us in the provision of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. So God calls us to believe what he says, even though it may sound very unlikely at times. But remember, God has a flawless record of faithfulness. Not one word has ever failed. The psalmist said in Psalms 18, verse 30, it says, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for those who take refuge in him. The first point that I want to make this morning is that, and this is my favorite point out of this whole story, is that we must never let our current situation dictate our direction what we are going through now we can't let that dictate where we are looking to in the future we can't let that dictate our direction and man this point hits crazy for me this morning because the world is basically shutting down right now and that is that's bonkers to me but this current situation we can't let it dictate our direction because we know that God still has so much he wants to do through us and so we could, just, we could just give up and say, well, we're not going to do anything because I can't go anywhere. Or I, can't, I can't go talk to people or the world's shutting down. I can't go to work. I can't, I can't go anywhere. I have to stay home. No, we can't just give up. We can't let that dictate the rest of, of, of the way our life operates. So anyway, let's, let's take a look at this situation here. In, in verse 3, it says, now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance of the gate. These, these are the main characters in the story that I want to highlight. Notice their location at the gate. They weren't allowed in the city. But why? Well, the reason is because of their illness. Leviticus gives us a detailed look at, at those who could, who could approach the altar. Lepers would not be able to worship God. Why? Because God requires the best. It had to be the best man. But let me tell you something this morning. Jesus is our best. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 reads, Therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate. Jesus has made a way for us to approach God with boldness. Jesus takes our place, and he is certainly our best. So a leper could not come into the city gates because anyone who came into contact with a leper was also considered unclean and would not be fit to worship or approach the altar. Lepers were isolated, and that's a familiar word this morning. In order for, for the, they were isolated in order for the members of the city to maintain their status to worship. It gets worse. The lepers, even more shameful, as they sat outside, and any time someone approached them or as they were entering or leaving the city, they were commanded to stand up, cup their hands over their mouth, and say, unclean, unclean, unclean. What a life of shame that must have been. So can you imagine having to live like this can you imagine the amount of worth that these lepers were reviewed with by the people? Here's where I'll just throw my two cents worth of, of commentary in here. 
What's so important about who these men were? Well, it's because if God can use sick, leprous men, then God can use garbage collectors. God can use pool room operators, bus boys, kids raised by single parents, guys and girls out of poverty. God can and God will use anybody. The reality is this, though. Some of us are, are, are sitting at the gate experiencing the, the spiritual famine that we never thought would come. And we're asking the question, am I where I will die? It's that bad. So let's look at the conversation that these lepers are having at the gate. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite movies growing up was The Jungle Book, the, the cartoon version. They have since redone it, but if you remember, in that version, there's these, I don't know, what, what, what do you call them, like vultures or buzzers, whatever they're doing. They're sitting in the tree, and they're like, they're asking each other. They're bobbing their shoulders up and down. They're like, what do you want to do today? Well, I don't know. What do you want to do? And then one of them finally says, well, look, I, I first say, what are we going to do? Then you say, I don't know. What you want to do? Then I say, what are we going to do? You say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What you want? Let's do something. And I just love that. That always cracked me up as a kid. My brother and I, we would do it back and forth to each other just riding down the, the freeway, I don't know. It's kind of dumb, but, <laughs> but I imagine as I'm thinking about these lepers, for some reason that comes up, just they're sitting at the gate just like asking each other, like, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do today? Are we going to do anything different than what we've done yesterday? Are we going to do anything different than what we did the day before that? And I just imagine it's just this back and forth, like, are we just going to sit here until we die? Like, what are we doing? So they're sitting there at the entrance of the gate and, and they're having that conversation. And then finally, in verse three, they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? Now I've sat in many job trainings and classes and I've asked that same question. Why am I sitting here until I die? Um, but seriously though, that's what's happening in a lot of situations. We are sitting in our spiritual famine waiting to die. Families are sitting today. People are sitting today. Leaders are sitting today. Churches are sitting today, and we've got to move from our gate and go. God wants to use us. Out of starvation and desperation, watch what God is going to do next. He's going to use these four lepers to save the entire city. So in verse 4, it says, If we say, let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So now come. Let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And I love language like that. It's so straightforward. If somebody kills me, I die. If they don't kill me, I get to live. You don't need a commentary to interpret that one. But here's, here's what I want us to see is that here are four people, and they're in this dilemma, and we can't miss this. They're willing to, they're willing to obey God and go into the enemy camp, even if it costs them their life. And until we get to the point where we die to ourself and we surrender to God to say, God, whatever you will, I'm not going to allow the obstacles to, to keep me from moving. I'm going to march to the drumbeat of glory, and I'm going to do it for the glory of God, regardless of what it costs me. So if we want to see God move, then we can't sit where we are, whatever that means for us this morning, whatever you're sitting in this morning. We can't remain there. We have, to, we have to not let that situation dictate our direction. We have to move. And the lepers, they know that they are about to risk it all. Out of all the people in the city, the lepers are the ones who take the first step. It was a major obstacle for these four guys. But remember, God majors in removing obstacles. And so watch this. In verse five, it says, so they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. I like the way that the New King James Version puts it here. It says, instead of behold, there was no one there. It says, to their surprise, no one was there. And if I have my Bible in my lap and I'm watching or listening to this and I have a pen in my hand and I have my Bible out, I would either, whatever yours says, behold, surprise, whatever that word is there, I would circle it because I'll tell you, that is what God does when when somebody obeys what he has challenged them to do, God will surprise you. So let me ask you something. I don't know how long you've been on your journey, but when is the last time that, that, that we have experienced a divine surprise in our life? I mean, how do you get, how do you get from, from here 
to there in your life. All of us ought to be at a point of, of being surprised, and I'll tell you, the most miserable leader out there is anyone who feels that they got to where they are today without God's divine surprise. Maybe you can, you, you'll try to figure it out in your life. Well, I, I, I sort of ought to be there because I did this right, I did this right, and then I did this right. No, I have done nothing to be where I am now. I am totally surprised. And so let me, let me just say this. Thank God for people in your life that believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. When I was in seminary, I, I, I've always struggled with sort of being self-critical of myself, and, and that's something that the, word, the, the Lord has to kind of work in my life. But when I was in seminary, papers and tests, man, I'd come home and I'd, I'd tell Rebecca, I'd be like, I don't, I don't know, I, I didn't do good. I think I got an F on that paper. I failed that test just now. And I'd be so stressed out and so critical of myself. And she, the whole step of the way, she's like, I know about you, man. You, you do this to yourself. Uh, you probably got an A on it. And I'm like, no, babe, this time it's, it's bad, this time. Every time, I would do it, every time. Next day I'd come back, oh, I got an A on the test. <laughs> and so it, and not, not, just, not just tests and papers like job interviews or even s- silly things like my Chick-fil-A order. I get not confident about what I'm ordering. She's always there behind me, you know. No, you got it. You get, you're good. I believe in you. And by the way, most people that have ever amounted to something, it is because somebody else believed in them. It's often said, I don't know who said this either, but I love this. It's one of my favorite quotes. If you see a turtle on a fence post, know someone put it there. God ultimately raises up leaders for one primary reason. His glory. He shows his power in our weakness. He demonstrates his wisdom in our folly. And so we are all like a turtle on a fence post. Am I right? God puts us where we are according to his good pleasure. Here it is again. Look at this next word in verse six. For the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sounds of chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army, so that they said to one another, behold, The king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to come against us. Did you notice in verse 6, if I were to circle another word or another phrase, whatever it says there for you, here's here's what I'd circle. Some some versions say cause, or some this one says, for the Lord has made. The Lord had made. How did this happen? The Lord caused it. I'm telling you, you want to talk about the, the sovereignty of God. God is in charge. God knows where you are. God knows how to cause these things to happen in your life. So God removed the obstacle, and then look at verse 8. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent and ate and drank, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried off things from it and went and hid them. You want to talk about the misery of these four characters Here they were sitting on the outside uh, in their misery, and yet God chooses to speak into their life through the message of the prophet Elisha. You see, here is is where where people are. A lot of us are are still sitting in contemplation at the gate. What am I going to do in my life? A lot of us are sitting there. Or others are are, are, that we've moved from, from sitting in contemplation to getting more things in our life through greed. This is, this is how this passage is moving. They have absolutely nothing. There's nothing to eat. There's a famine in the city. There's, there's nothing to eat to the point where, where people are, are boiling their children and eating dove waste and, and, and the heads of animal. And then God moves, steps into that situation, moves into that, and he gives them more than enough for themselves. He not only gives them more than enough for themselves, he gives them enough for the whole city, the entire city. If I, if I never attend another Sunday school, if I never hear another sermon, I, ha- I know that I have enough resources to tell everyone I meet for the rest of my life about the good news of Jesus. But what do I do with those resources that God has given me? I do exactly what these four men did. Once I get not only what I needed, 
But even what I, I need to share back in the city where the people are perishing, I hide it. That's greed. And I, 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 I think that, that one of the great sins that, that we as a nation will have to deal with at the judgment seat of Christ is that we'll have to deal with the sin of loving pleasure so much and being such a greedy people that we didn't support the work of Jesus like we should have. Like I said, I'm preaching to myself here this morning. And as I think about that, I'm reminded of, of the story of Jonah, and we see him trying to escape. We, just, we see him trying to hide God's grace from the Ninevites. The only thing that Jonah found in that was trouble. We know that very well. So these lepers, they, they hid it, and this brings us, they, they hide that, and, and it brings us to our next point. The second point I want to make is that we must never hide what God has done or what God is doing in our life. In verse 9, they, they said to one another, they're going to have, this, they're going to have this, another meeting. They're ready to stop sitting in contemplation. They've contemplated long enough, and they know that, that greed is a dead end. And the great joy in life is, is not what you receive, but what you can give. And we see in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it says, I'm more, it's more blessed to give than receive. So they finally come to that point, and so they say, and listen to their language, it says, they, they come together and they say, we are not doing right. Wow, what a confession, a, a conviction by these lepers. They say, this is a day of good news. Well, what's, what's good news got to do with it? This is, this is the Old Testament Great Commission, in my opinion. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. This is a day of good news. We've got it. We can't remain silent. We have to go back to the city and tell them about it. It says, if we remain silent, and that's what's wrong, is, is, is we're, we're remaining silent. There's been a conversation that's, that's happening in, in seminaries and churches and talking about, even at, talking about, are we getting the gospel right? That is a great conversation to have, and it's helpful. It's been very helpful to me. But honest to God, there comes a time where we, where we stop talking about where we get it right, and we go out and we help people to get right. It's not just that, that we can define the gospel. We've got to go out and declare the gospel. Listen to this language. If we wait, this is the lepers talking again. If we wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. So we see that, that selfishness leads to calamity, but, but selflessness leads to life. And then they say to each other, Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Now, I just have, I have a few more final thoughts, and then I'll pray for us. If we look at verse 5 and verse 6, that just simply reminds us of that God is in control, the Lord's control, and that encourages me this morning. If we, if we remember, Paul told Timothy that at times he is faithless, but God is faithful. God is in control. He's got the whole world in his hands. God is in control, but let me tell you something else. Even though God surprised them, and, and he caused some things to happen that, that God has always been good to them, good to me. Augustine put it this way, God has been good to me. He's given me more than I need, but he's shown me others that need it. So it moves from the Lord's control and all that he's done in your life, and he moves to the leper's greed. And it's like, how could, how could I be so stingy with what God has given me? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 10 through 11 says, it's the Lord that gives me the strength to earn wealth. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, what do I have that I did not receive? Everything. One more, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, I am what I am by the grace of God. I have nothing to boast in. I'm where I am at in life because of King Jesus. Anything good that has ever happened to me or, or in me is because of Jesus. Why would I want to take what God has given me and, and hide it to keep it all for myself? But then these lepers, they, they have their little meeting together, and then here's the words. They say, we're not doing right. You know what that is? That is old-fashioned Holy Spirit conviction. What have you been convicted of lately? When's the last time the, the Holy Spirit of God brought us to a point of conviction that led us to a, a period of 
repentance in our life. And then look what that conviction did. It did in their life what it's intended to do in my life. It brought them to a time of confession. Well, what's, what's their confession? And they say, this is a day of good news. It doesn't talk about it's a good day of good news to, to go to Numinous and to sit down and, and, and debate theology with people. It doesn't talk about how it's a day of good news to sit around the dinner table and, and share family drama and family secrets while others are perishing, and the point is that they're going to perish forever. Why do we spend all of our time talking about family secrets when there's so many that are not in the family? So it's a day of good news, but what is the good news? It's that a loving God came down and and lived the life that I should have lived when I didn't deserve it, died the death that I should have died when I didn't deserve it, made a way for me to be right with God when I didn't deserve it, and that all I have to do is, is, is to believe that and put my faith and my trust in Jesus and to follow after him and to partake in this mission that he has given to each and every one of us a purpose to, to love him and to serve him and to worship him. That sounds like a lot, but it's, it's, it's pretty simple. And we, uh, my life, I make it very difficult sometimes. Just choosing to remind myself of that, that glorious truth every day that through Jesus, God has given me life. And I take it for granted. I, I, I keep it and I hide it and I don't go and I don't move from my gate through the things that I'm struggling in and I don't move and I don't go and I don't take that and share it with other people. There are no what ifs at death. There are, there are only two words that can sum up death. That's either triumph or tragedy. Triumph through Jesus or tragedy in the fact that, that we never knew him. So their conclusion, these lepers, they say, if we wait, we're not even going to wait until tomorrow morning. No, we're going to go. In these uncertain and weird days that we're going through, we still need to find the courage to go. Whatever that looks like. Maybe I'm not telling you to go out physically out of your house and, oh, I'm going to interact with so many people. No, go and, and finding other ways to to be a part of, of what God is doing. Be other ways to be a part of sharing this good news. Maybe it's through donating supplies. Maybe it's through, you know, a group of five people are getting together to, I don't know, do something for the community. Maybe you can take a part of that. I don't want you to put your, your, your health in jeopardy. Don't, don't hear me in saying that. I'm just saying there's other ways right now to, to take part in what God is doing. Like I said, we, we can't let our, our current situation dictate our direction. This church is doing so much right now to, to help us in that. We're hosting our kitchen uh, to the Highland Lakes Crisis Network. They're coming in and they're cooking and, and, and they're, they're doing so many things here. We're live streaming services. I mean, we're not letting our current situation dictate our direction is what I'm trying to say. So how, how can we be a part of that? How can we keep finding new ways to do that during this time? And that's what the lepers decided to do. They decided to go decided to go and find out what God was doing outside of the city. And then there was this divine surprise. And they didn't, they chose not to hide it. And I just, they had that courage to, to go even when they were risking their lives. So I don't have time to deal with the rest of it, but basically what it, what it does is that everything Elisha said would happen, did happen. The last point was, you know, we must never question what God has already proclaimed. That, that, that captain, that old fellow who said that he, that he was a naysayer at the beginning of it, uh, at the end, when they went out of the city to see what was happening, the people got so excited that when they found all the horses, the clothing, and all the food, that there was a stampede at the gate, and the man that was critical in the beginning, he died in the stampede. And what the, prophesy, what the prophecy, I mean, what the prophet had prophesied uh, was manifested. But I, I, I want you to know, I'm telling you, that, that God still desires to bless and to use his people. And so I'll just close where I started. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He wants to use you in your, uh, despite whatever situation or whatever you've got going on in your life. He wants to use you in that. So I, just, I pray this morning that, that God blesses you, that God uses you. I just, I just pray that we decide we're not doing right. This is a day of good news. 
Let's not even wait till tomorrow's morning sunrise. Let's go and tell them that we found everything we need to sustain our city. In Jesus' name, we love you, we worship you, and bless you. Amen. I didn't really quite mention anything about this, but if, if you're not aware, this is uh, Rebecca and I. This is our, our last Sunday here, uh, and we're, we've been so grateful to be a part of this church family. We've been so blessed by this church, and as we were sort of thinking about the things uh, in which, the ways in which this church has blessed us and, and thinking about our time leaving here and, and just, you know, talking about things that are going on in the world during this this sort of pandemic, we came, Bex, Bex kind of came across this song, it was just released, well, like a week or two ago, uh, she came across it, and she was like, Grayson, you, you gotta listen to this song, it is such an awesome song, and so we're listening to it, we've sort of been worshiping, worshiping to it over the past week or so, and we just wanted to simply share it this morning, as uh, the, the verse, it, it, it comes straight from scripture, uh, in Numbers, you know, and it talks about the Lord bless you and keep you and, and make his face shine upon you. In this weird time, we want to leave this blessing with not only this church, but, but this community that, that God has given to us, that uh, the writer of Numbers and, and even it's referenced in Psalms, that, you know, that God has not forsaken us. God has not forgotten us. That we just, this is sort of a prayer that, that God continues to, to bless you and yours and your family for generations and generations. And that and the rest of the song talks about how God is with us. He's he's for us. He's he doesn't say it doesn't say this in the song, but he's not against us. I uh, just kinda wants to roll off the tongue there. But we're just uh we're we're blessed by this song and we just we wanted to share it with you. shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. And I
children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations your family your children their children their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you he is with you and with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in the coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he's for you 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 and i Thank you, Grayson and Rebecca. I asked Grayson if I could do the benediction because this is a special day. It's a sad day for us as a church family. And ordinarily, we'd have a big reception today, thanking God for their ministry in our midst, for the presence of Beckett in our midst, and you guys too. Brothers and sisters, I hope in the coming weeks you'll find ways to express your love and your appreciation for them in a way that we would do ordinarily today. I want to thank them personally for their ministry in our midst. And we will miss them. But we know that God goes with them. And God goes before them. And we trust that. So brothers and sisters, for our benediction today. Be challenged by the message that you have heard. Be challenged in the opportunities God gives us in this very unique situation. To go. To have the courage to have strength to step out in faith and to go and do as God calls us to do, even in these situations that we are in today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>